Welcome everyone. It is especially wonderful to be with all of you here today to celebrate the joys of living with Japanese art and especially ceramics and how best to display them in your own home. Tonight, we have over 350 attendees from at least 12 countries, from Melbourne, Beijing, Kyoto to Dublin, Paris, Frankfurt, Rome, Tel Aviv, and several remarkably in Russian cities. For the first time, we have someone here from Uruguay, welcome. And we have many, many hailing from Canada, from Vancouver to Montreal. Our US guests are located in over 26 states, from Texas to Wisconsin, Oregon to Florida. I also heartily uh, welcome our numerous curators and academicians from around the globe, and most especially the countless collectors, gallerists, art appraisers, and simply our fan club of clay enthusiasts. As I am certain most of you know well, after receiving my master's in Japanese art from Columbia, I've been an independent dealer specializing in Japanese works of art for 45 years. My initial focus was on art of the Edo era, Japanese screens, hanging scrolls, and ukiyo-e woodblock prints. And while they remain an area of my specialization, my primary interest in Japanese clay took off after repeated visits in 1983 to an exhibition in Washington, D.C. called Japan Ceramics Today. From that point forward, I was determined to bring this material to the attention of the American public. As a private dealer, I exhibited either at art fairs, antique shows, or at other galleries. Slowly but surely, I began to build a community of US collectors and museum curators looking to broaden their holdings in the area of modern clay art. The International Asian Art Fair launched in 1994 in Manhattan enabled me to have two areas for my large stand in the center of the show, one for antiques and the other as a vehicle for solo shows by clay artists. In March of every year, US Asian art curators and collectors made it their must attend destination, enabling contemporary Japanese clay art to be seen by the most important collectors of Asian art in both America and Europe. The response was incredible and the number of museums interested in collecting in this important field grew exponentially. And here I'm just showing you two shots from uh, different clients who are using Japanese clay art in very different ways. One to complement a wonderful painting by Katsushika Hokusai on the left, and the other as a focal point for an entrance to a very um, wonderful home in New England. As my range grew, so did the collections of acquisitive and serious clients, as you can easily appreciate in the, these in, this image of the home of Halsey and Alice North, where in a New York apartment, the only place to put things was literally over the windows and shelves were cre created throughout the house to accommodate their burgeoning collection. With such a demand by the collecting public, both individual and institutional, and also persistent support of the artists themselves who really needed greater visibility through solo shows in the US market, I decided to open my current gallery in 2007. And since that time, I have presented more than 90 shows. Here's another shot of Alice and Halsey's apartment where there wasn't one surface left unadorned, but artfully presented in a very American adaptation of a Japanese tokonoma. This burgeoning of interest led to the request by the leading art publisher in Japan to author a book intended truly to wake up the Japanese market to just what the West found so alluring about Japanese ceramics. Indeed, a large part of that argument was based on how Americans, which was my focus, chose to amass and display this art form in both their museums and homes. Many Japanese readers um, have commented to me recently that the photos of the home presentations for, for them was the most captivating part of the book. So for me as a private dealer and a fair exhibitor and then a gallerist, the artful display has always been an important part of my life and my career. 
And along the way, I have been the beneficiary of the exquisite taste and gifted eyes of several professionals who I've asked to join with us here tonight. This marvelous panel of four experts, each of whom has helped me in a very significant way, is joining us from California and New York. So in the order of which my friendships were formed, I'm going to give you a sense of why I chose these men and these women to be here. Paul Weisman, I met in, uh, I thought 1981, but he's claiming a little bit earlier, at the inaugural South uh, San Francisco Fall Antique Show. And he had yet, in my recollection, had yet to open his own firm. We became very close friends on that first meeting. He was at the booth across from me. And my husband and I had just moved back from Paris and had purchased a two bedroom apartment on Central Park West with a very complicated oblique view of Central Park over uh, a synagogue roof that you had to stand in one corner of the apartment to see the view. Otherwise you were looking at 101 Central Park West and bathrooms instead of the park. He had such great ideas about what one could do given this situation, sight unseen standing across from me at the fair, that we hired him immediately, even though he had yet to set up his firm and he was in San Francisco and the apartment was in New York. And bear in mind, this was the days before email, digital phones, cameras, FaceTime, or even home computers. He designed the living room and um, in San Francisco had fabricated a semicircular sofa casework and window treatments to best showcase the view from the, the, the one angle that you could actually get it. His concept was so successful that it enabled us to sell our apartment six years later for double what we paid for it. And the new buyer wanted the room as is. So great, great work for sure. Uh, and of course, we immediately hired him when we bought yet another apartment on Central Park West, despite the distance problems. And through the decades, those rooms have undergone many changes as both our finances and needs is involved. And as I'm sure many of you remember, uh, those who are longtime clients, you will remember some of these views as we get to them a little later on in our discussion. My next friend of long time standing is Pilar Conde. And my husband was, Bob, was the first to meet Pilar uh, when he was an attorney and she was a pioneering high level banker with Morgan Guarantee. And at the time there were few, if any, women at such a level. I met her initially at the Winter Antique Show in the early 1990s when she was buying Japanese woodblock prints. Uh, and at the time only antiques were allowed into the fair, so that wasn't part of the discussion. But when the International Asian Art Fair opened in 1994 and she came, came to the fair to acquire antique Chinese material, she became enraptured with Japanese ceramics. Pilar as a world traveler and sophisticated collector in many diverse areas, um, immediately gravitated to the uniqueness of Japanese ceramics and it became her leading passion. Upon retiring from Morgan, uh, we've been lucky enough to travel together with our husbands to Japan, and she has a very keen understanding of Japanese aesthetic sensibilities, and her collection exquisitely graces both of her homes in the city and the country. Next, uh, Robert Couturier. I first met Robert when he completed work on the home of a celebrated writer and a son of a treasured client who in turn became his client uh, with his new wife to design their um, really a very impressive apartment on Fifth Avenue. We continued to meet at celebratory occasions, both in the city and the country, and of course at art and antique fairs. So when it came time in 2019 to at long last rethink Paul's design in our Central Park West apartment, uh, having moved my business into my gallery, I thought of Robert. Paul's marvelous work had elegantly and successfully stead the, stead the test of literally 35 years, but it was designed for our previous lifestyle. And so we turned to New York's finest, Robert, and this ended up being incredibly prescient because the job had to be completed mid pandemic. And of course, the choice of a local designer during this extended period of isolation proved to be providential and bravo, Robert, we finished it in the middle of the worst of it. 
um, we're eternally grateful. Uh, Jane um, comes to me through a real estate broker, actually. When I found my public gallery through a broker, uh, Susan Anthony in 2007, it was a big step for me, uh, having been a private dealer for 35 years. And it was came at a moment when the stock market was crashing and most people were closing their art galleries. However, as Bob, my husband was retired and spending more time at home, and I had a full-time team working in my apartment, it was time to move my gallery out. Um, and Jane redesigned what was a medical office into an amazing facility. She, she, besides being a gifted architect, was at one time a potter, so she really understood clay. Um, my only mandate was that she feature materials that I had seen at another artist studio in Japan, Miwa Kazuhiko, who's featured our current show, in which to use Japanese recycled wood, steel, and a touch of glass. And she adapted brilliantly to that, that solitary uh, dictate that I have. 17 years later, her design has proven to be so perfect and forward thinking that we have changed virtually nothing, including the paint color. And even as recently as today, her design received compliments for every, from nearly every first time visitor. So let's get started. I'm sure you're anxious to hear from everyone. Um, what I'm going to do is first present their more formal credentials before I ask them a question. And we are gonna rotate the questions among the panelists. If any of you have questions yourself, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we will attend to those questions at the conclusion of our presentation. So my first question will go to Robert Couturier. Robert, Robert is French born and New York based as an interior designer at the top of this profession and continues to execute grand scale commissions in the United States, Europe, South America and Russia. He has been included in Architectural Digest, prestigious annual list of the best decorators and architects in the world, and his name has become synonymous with continental and international style. To the deep understanding of the classical, he acquired at the Ecole Camondo in his native Paris, and he adds his own inimitable touch. Robert has contributed to major architecture and design books, he lectures widely at art galleries and at art and antique fairs, and he participates in charitable and design industry events. His works have been featured in such publications as Architectural Digest, Vogue, Vanity Fair, Town and Country, The New York Times, Condé Nast Traveler, House and Garden, The Rob Report, and El Decor. Robert can be said to lend a sense of connoisseurship, imagination, and even experimentation to the traditional landscape. And to that, I say, hear, hear, Robert. Thank you. So my uh, first question to you is, uh, Japanese art and design have a unique look and are reflective of an artistic climate, history, and culture that can be quite different from those of your clients based in the United States or Europe. So as a designer, what do you find appealing and exciting about Japanese art? And how do those differences open up new ways of thinking and seeing? Robert? Thank you very much, Joan. Um, Japanese art is always something that we, uh, as you know, French person by the end of, from the end of the 19th century to the early part of the 20th century, they were incredibly fashionable. And actually, we all inherited Japanese art in a way um, you know, that we always, we've always known it. I don't think that we knew of Japanese art what it really meant. And I think that we were attracted by the aesthetics of Japanese art, more so than by the meaning of Japanese art. And I think that the, probably the weaknesses that we have in collecting it is that we collect them for what we perceive as prettiness and beauty rather than the deep meaning that they might have. So I think it's, uh, and that was very interesting when we started working together and I, you explained to me more about it, to realize how very different and how very opposed 
the Japanese culture is to the European culture, but complementary in many ways. Um, you know, we have European decorative artists are about decoration. They're about ornaments. And all of what the French have done in the 18th century up to today is to take Japanese and Asian, you know, pottery and mount them in gold and mount them and make them to the taste of the European market. I think what is interesting and what interested me when I started working on my own and, and working with clients is trying to respect the Japanese culture for what I knew and try to discover more. And in using Japanese decorative arts, not in a sort of a vamp vampire way, sort of a appropriation way, and try to respect it as much as possible for what I knew. I think the beauty of Japanese art is in the form. And I think the forms are probably more refined than the European forms. I think the colors are also always surprising and unexpected. And actually, I think should be treated as independent element rather than complementary element in decorative schemes. And um, I think it, what the image that you have on the screen now, which is this, do you remember this pair of Japanese palace vases that were absolutely huge and that we bought in Paris. And I think the, the fascination that they had was for the volume that they represented in the room and the balance in the room. However, I think the refinement of the form is such um, that, you know, it goes completely beyond the places in which we, we, we've used them. And I think they retain their own value and their own quality in spite of where they are. And I think that the one thing about Japanese art, also Japanese culture and Japanese, is that everything is, you know, contained and subdued and because of the despair and the sparsity of design of, of decoration, each form is important and each form is complete in itself. So I think um, I, you know, I, in, I enjoy Japanese art Im immensely and I wish that I would use it much more than I do. This is, the, this is a screen that, um, you see, the thing which is also amazing about Japanese art is, is we use it in a way that is desacralized. You know, it doesn't have, we forget the meaning that these panels have, and we only look at the decorative elements of them. But I think that going beyond that and trying to find where it is from, why they were created that way, why those colors were chosen, why the forms were the way that they are, and why they've been in existence for so long. You know, Japanese and Chinese art is a continuity. I mean, French decorative art is all by period. It's not, and the period doesn't flow, you know, harmoniously into the other. There are some very opposed to each other. So, there is a, a cultural interest in it, which I find absolutely fascinating. And you see the, the Japanese lacquered piece also that's on the right, which obviously is taken from, uh, from you know, pieces of furniture that were bought there and then disassembled and assembled in new pieces of furniture, which is, which is you know, somewhat disrespectful, but you know, done at the time. And I think today we do things quite differently. Beautiful. I, 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 I actually love uh, gold uh, Japanese vessels, gold mounted. I think that's beautiful. Well, Ormolu is very alluring for sure. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. I, I have to say that um, when we, I lived in Paris in the late seventies and used to haunt the auction houses at Hotel Duo, um, you could tell at that time that what came up at Duo. Uh, from various collections that the French were traditionally from the 19 teens and 20s, collecting not as collectors, a serious collection, but for the decorative element and for the yes. sense of form and design, exactly as you state. And when you go to the Musée Guimet or you go to the 
the um, Caimondo Musee Caimondo or the other homes of these amazingly uh, brilliant collectors, while they collected French furniture very seriously, the Japanese art was always peripheral and more ornamental, I would say. Yes. But yes. I, I'm, I'm a fan of this room. I love this room. And it's Thank amazing you. how you've pulled so many disparate aesthetics and cultures into one vista. Thank, thank I think you. I think that there. also mixing cultures is obviously what makes each culture richer because yeah. they all are in reaction to each other. Jane, may I turn to you? Um, Jane Sachs is the founding principal at HS2 Architecture in New York. Her ability to creatively interpret her clients' needs and desires while working within a framework of practical constraints has led to many award-winning projects, a skill she has honed over many years as an accomplished ceramicist working within the medium story tradition. Jane's 30 years of experience ranges from galleries to high-end retail to bespoke apartments and large-scale office interiors. Memorable projects include the Long Island Beach House for the late Jay uh, Chait, now currently owned by Ellie Tahari, a 750-acre estate outside of Nashville, Tennessee, and most recently, the family office and private gallery for business entrepreneur Len Riggio. She has contributed design to exhibitions that have traveled throughout the world, promoting such organizations as Human Rights Watch, Doctors Without Borders, and Save Dafur. Jane was a 2002 uh, New York Coro Leadership Fellow. She studied ceramics at Alfred University and received her Master's of Architecture from Columbia University, um, my alma mater. Jane, my question, first question to you is, uh, not only are you a gifted architect, but obviously you have a great background in clay, which gives you additional insights into some of the artworks owned by your clients. Can you give us an example of an installation or presentation involving Japanese art that surprised, challenged, or perhaps even invigorated you? I understand there was a project that extended your perspective in the incorporation of Japanese aesthetics into a New England context. Could you please tell us this story? Jane? Hi, thank you so much, Joan. Yeah. Well, you're a big part of this story because you introduced me to my client. Um, so my client had for many years been collecting Japanese ceramics and displaying it throughout her house. And the program that my client gave us was that she wanted to create a study room. She wanted a room where she could read about Japanese art and culture. She could study Japanese and also have the opportunity for the first time to be surrounded by selected pieces from her collection. In her house, there was a front room that was rarely used. And this was the room that was decided to become her sanctuary within the house. In this image, you see the entry into the study room all the way through to a window on the front of the house. The entry walls are covered in a pretty dramatic red hand painted um, wallpaper marking the transition from the house into her little gallery for her collection. The red, I guess, also was used as it recalls the kind of red of Japanese lacquerware. So the next image. So now you've come through and you're in the room. Um, in this image, um, part of the program from my client again was that she wanted to leave all of the traditional molding. Uh, there was a, oh, a fireplace and an 18th century mirror that are favorites of her husband and those two were to remain. Um, again, in this room, we use the same wallpaper as was used in the entry, but now it is a much quieter color. And um, my client always said that this wallpaper reminded her of the mud walls that she had seen in her travels in Japan in the country homes. Um, the other thing that 
you know, you will see is that what we tried to do was to give her a variety of display areas for her large collection. Um, and what we've also tried to do was to build upon that notion of symmetry, asymmetry. So no wall is exactly the same, but hopefully we achieve a sort of balance between the asymmetry of the pieces and the shelving and how it all works together. Um, this is a view where you're looking back towards the main house and you can see again through the doorways, another one of her pieces. And also in this shot, you see how we created this language of the asymmetry in the upper shelves. We also had the lower storage that also had bookshelves in it. And within all this shelving, the spaces below the hanging shelves, the bookshelves were all very important to my client because for her to be in this room, it's not only just the pieces she's collected, it's the work she looks at, it's the books she reads, it's the boxes they come in. All of them are very important to her. This is just a small detail showing you how we sort of detailed the edge of the shelves and you know integrated built-in LED lighting. And then this is a this last piece is one of the pieces that I think is one of my clients' favorites. So it was right at the entry to the room. And again, here it sort of recalls a tokenoma, but obviously it's not a tokenoma because it's not a scroll but it marks the entry. And for her, it was a very important piece. Um, I think one of the things I want to say is that my client always says to me that for her, this room has a very particular energy. I'm not really quite sure what she meant by that, but I hope that it is the result of our collaboration between our design and her very, very important collection. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, having visited this amazing room, I have reveled in its beauty and its tranquility. And what you've done is have a design where each piece really shines and it stands apart, but she's also able to make wonderful conversations between the pieces. Um, one thing I'd, I'd ask you, if you could talk a little bit, the lighting in this room is quite fabulous. Uh, and, and not obvious how you would light all these things without having um, a bunch of ridiculous number of tracks coming from the ceiling, but it, it's lit very effectively with very little natural light coming in. Can you just so, talk about that? This is an issue that so many yeah. of my clients ask about. Yeah, so Truth be told, Joan, there is a track in the ceiling oh, okay. <laughs> that you're not seeing, you're not seeing because this room had about 11 foot ceiling, so it's quite tall. But, you know, for my client, it was extremely important um, that the lighting was integrated and that the lighting also, because you, she didn't want the shelves blocking the light for, on the pieces that were on the lower storage units on the credenzas. So, I mean, as I did with you, you know, I worked, I have to say, I worked with a lighting consultant and they're worth their weight in gold if they're good. And, um, you know, nowadays, because the LED fixtures are so small, it's possible now to create these like half inch by half inch little slits in which I can you know, detail a shelf to have a light to come down and light. And the other unusual thing that he did is he not only has the light in the front so that it washes down and hits the pieces on the credenza, on the top shelf, because you want to light up, there is a light that's situated at the back of the shelf. So it mm -hmm. lights up the walls and also lights those pieces that are on the top shelf. So... That's the trick. Thank, thank you. It, it's, it's not a trick, it's an art. <laughs> thank you, Jane. Thank um, you. I would like to now go to my old friend, Paul, who's the president of the Wiseman Group and has been in business designing for 42 years. 
As I've said before, based out of San Francisco, his firm, the Wiseman Group, has a staff of 48 that provides interior design and architectural services for a global list of projects, both residential and commercial. Paul has worked and is currently working with internationally renowned architects such as Ricardo, I'm sorry, Ricardo Logaretta and Peter Bolin and Frank Gehry, as well as notable firms as Ferguson Shamimian and Andrew Serkin Architects. He has assisted Salesforce with their global real estate rollout and continues to serve Salesforce in Dublin, Sydney, and Tokyo. One of his most unusual design projects is an exploration yacht, which is currently roving the islands of Tahiti. Among Paul's favorite project is one of the multiple houses he worked on with the architect Ricardo Logaretta, who is a protege of Luis Barragan, which is located on the big island of Hawaii. So Paul, dear friend, um, my question to you is as an interior designer with over 40 years experience, some of your clients have, may have had existing Japanese art collections. Can you tell us about how you work together with a collector to envision a display to their best advantage? And how did that existing collection determine your choice of color palette, materials, and your overall vision? Paul? Well, thank you, Joan. Um, well, I had the great privilege of having one of my very first clients being a major collector named Joan Mervis. <laughs> and her apartment in New York, um, the second one, uh, this is a picture of us when we first did the, the one, one phase of it. And um, it was a real uh, eye opener. I'd, I'd always appreciated Japanese objects. I grew up in the uh, rural area of California that where we had a very large Japanese community. So we had a lot of Japanese friends. And so I was familiar with um, many Japanese things, but never to the level that Joan introduced me to. Um, okay. So we had a unique situation here where she actually was a dealer a collector and she and her husband had bought an art deco apartment um, and they collected art deco furniture and American um, uh, 19th century art and some 20th century art. And so we had to put it all together. Um, and she, um, because she dealt out of their, their house of the early, day, early days, she was very Japanese in her aesthetic of, of um, moving things around. So we had to create a, a place for her to uh, store things. So in the, in the living room, uh, we designed these uh, columns. There's another one on the right side um, in a deco fashion. So, and they, are actually, they actually open in our storage areas. Um, and the shelves are lit. Um, the, I think the second phase, they got better lit <laughs> when, the, when LEDs came out. Um, and um, uh, I had seen a, a small stone fireplace, I think at the Paris flea market that was of this design, but it was not appropriate. So we built this fireplace to surround to feel like it had been in the apartment originally. Then the great thing though, that, that I think um, Joan um, really taught me is that the, because she and Bob collected uh, art deco furniture, um, the, the relationship of Art Deco and Japanese is, is very uh, symbiotic, I'd say, for, for me, because the, uh, Deco has a kind of clean line. Um, and so the uh, angles in, of, of modern and antique Japanese uh, objects works beautifully with that. And uh, so you can see here where the, uh, it, it becomes a, a complete sculpture. Um, we, we actually designed these uh, floor lamps based on the Japanese lacquer uh, candlesticks. <laughs> they never made them that big. <laughs> I, I had an artisan that cheated. Um, and you know, this was many years ago and, and I think it's, it's held up very well. And I know now it has a new fat, fabulous new look and which is also extremely beautiful. Um, so, yeah, so Joan, Joan and I, of course, um, we, we are very good friends. And we also have a, a particular affinity to uh, the same colors. And I think that made it very, very appealing to work with her. Um, but, you know, I, I work in many other realms and, and colors and styles, but um, the earth tones, the greens, the yellows, the browns, uh, Joan and I both naturally resonate in that zone. And I think that was particularly satisfying and uh, uh, working with my client. And um, uh, this is one of my favorite images. I actually used it in the entrance of the opening of my book 
because I, it shows the diversity of, of form and shape and texture and color um, and display. Uh, so it's one of my favorite uh, images. And in her dining room, um, we she had these uh, incredible, I think they were 18th century, where they owned the screens. Yeah, uh, tiger screens. And, and I was just so enamored with them. And you know, the traditional way of showing hanging screens, of course, is, is uh, would be have some angle to them. But in the dining room, that would not be practical. So we uh, did uh, two screens, two tables, and um, an upholstered uh, folding screen uh, with which with um, uh, fabric hinges, similar to the way Japanese do their folding hinges on their paper. And the uh, grass cloth, I think, gave it a very Asian background. It was a combination grass cloth and silk. And then we found these amazing Biedermeyer chairs that actually have a lacquered uh, section. You can't see in the image, but right at the top of the the middle of the back the, almost looked like a Japanese fan. And, uh, so it was a, a very complimentary uh, room. And again, light, lighting was very tricky. 1930s buildings, you don't, you don't, you don't get a lot of options <laughs> at the hard uh, ceilings. And so um, then also here's a, the, an image that shows how a singular Japanese piece and art deco furniture can have a very pleasant relationship, just the, the simplicity of it. I think that was the, yeah, okay, anyway, we're still friends. <laughs> we are definitely still friends, Paul, and I look back at um, what the apartment used to look like. It was wonderful, and it stood the test of time completely, and yes, you were right. Palette is really important, and working with a designer or uh, an architect who understands color or sees color the same way is critical to making a job successful or not successful. But I remember, Paul, you telling me back in the 1980s that if the client likes purple with white polka dots, you'll make it work, right? Agreed. You, you did say that. You could make I it did, work. I, I did, I did. And, and Joan, Joan uh, I was very grateful that she let it be published in Architectural Digest, which was yeah, very nice yes. also, which was okay. uh, a, a great credit to both of us. Yeah, well. Thank you, Paul. It's, it's, it's been a joy. Uh, Pilar, I'd like to um, come to you next. Pilar Conde was born and raised in Spain. She's a lawyer by training. And as I said, she had a successful year in banking and investment in the United States. Pilar in, initially began collecting Spanish and Chinese ceramics alongside of Spanish old masters. And over 25 years ago, she switched her principal interest to that of Japanese ceramics, and now has an incredibly important collection that includes many, many works by um, both living and deceased masters of the field. So Pilar, thank you for joining us today. And as a collector, um, I want you to speak to all the collectors in our audience, which are many, and they're from all over the world, all of whom would really like to hear from you. How did you first become attracted to Japanese art? And how do you think about and display your Japanese art within the context of your homes and also in conversation with your other collections, as well as the American art environment that they live in? Pilar? Well, as you said, I have always been interested in, in ceramics. Um, when I was growing up in Spain, I used to go to the kilns of local potters. I think at the time there were like 400 potters in the country to buy traditional dishes and jars. And I did start buying Chinese ceramics after a chance encounter with a Liao Pi in, uh, in New York. So I was buying early Chinese ceramics for a while till I choose uh, to go to the to the Japanese uh, ceramic, uh, I've been doing that now for, I don't know, 25, 30 years. Because I think the Japanese aesthetics and the sensibility, a bit of stir, even aesthetics, goes very well with the way my houses are. Not too much clutter, a bit minimalist, so I can rest, to read, and enjoy the family. Because the Japanese ceramic run from very simple, earthy traditional work to complex non-utilitarian even opulent pieces and they mix very well with um, western uh, environment 
regardless of your taste. Um, because I think we all have a very special way of looking at things that we have developed over the years. Uh, when we acquire something, regardless if it was 30 years ago or now, a ceramics, a painting, they always have, they always have something in common. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's not deliberate. I think it's almost unconscious. Uh, all these objects share shape, color patterns. So you can use them in everyday setting and you don't even have to think about how you are going to place an object when you buy or what is the lightning because you always find a place for it because it's always go with your overall taste. So my, my advice is buy whatever you make, uh, make you happy and don't worry too much about display or lightning Lightning, for example, I think is very important, but you know, the ceramic have to live with the light that we live. They are part of the family, so to speak. So we all share the same light. But what I really like is rotating the art and the object in and out of a storage, because then that allow me to continue to look at them with fresh eyes. They don't, belong to the aesthetics of the place only and it is not part of the furniture. Um, it goes very well. I'll show you some example with the images. The house where we live most of the time uh, looks from outside like a New England farmhouse. But inside I have a mix of um, Spanish um, um, old masters um, uh, 18th century uh, American furniture, especially from New England, is some Japanese touches here and there. In this uh, photograph, for example, <laughs> I have the Adoration of the Magi, which is a 17th century painter from, from Spain, uh, Herrera el Viejo. And I have a water jar from Caneta Masao. Um, the jar, the shape of the jar, the folds of the jar, the, the tone of the color of the jar, it really goes so well with the tunic of the, of the older magi. And then you have on the side a, a dish of a Nakamura taku with a crane, a white crane. Um, the earthy color of the of the clay goes very well with the Chinese table underneath. Um, that's, you can mix that very well. The, this one is similar uh, theory or similar practice. You have um, an 18th century painting, which is the Saint Michael and the Fallen Angel. And below there is a Hayashi Kaku flower base, huge, but it's a flower base actually. They have both similar color, red, gray, brown. And I bought the painting like 35 years ago and Kaku's piece, I think was five years ago. Um, the, this one is slightly different, still in the house. This is a, a New England, Tilt top table from the 18th century. The two pieces alongside, um, they are uh, both from uh, artists in, uh, in Kyoto. Miyashita uh, Senji with the blue color and the uh, Suzuki Osamo golden earthy tone of the piece uh, goes very well, the shape and the color with the, with the table and also with the Italia Hassan's uh, round base that is on top of the, of the table. This is a slightly different. This is the Japanese touch, as I say. This is a, a soaking tub. And the piece by it is a, is a piece that I absolutely love. Is the Ogawa Machiko round vessel. And I love the, the rough, white color of the of the clay 
and the way the 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 glaze, which is green, bluish, uh, pulls at the bottom like water, really like that. And um, this is slightly different. This is uh, the apartment uh, where I'm sitting now. Um, and this apartment is very uh, minimalist. I really don't have anything in there except what I really need to sit and to eat and to sleep. And, but this is a Kishieko uh, piece uh, with two paintings of a Spanish uh, uh, painter. Uh, his name is Salvador Victoria. And this is maybe one of the few pieces that I don't move around the, the Kishi because it's very heavy and it's kind of cumbersome to move. And this is a beautiful tall vase from Takeoshi Jun also with a painting uh, by Salvador Victoria. And this is a, a Tabuchi Taro uh, piece, very contemporary. Mm, I love also this piece is so wide and also I'm assuming, but it's, it's very sophisticated. I think it's on a low table. And on the background, you have two Sugo pieces. One is from Bisen, more traditional. And the other one you almost don't see it, but it's, I do because I know what it is. It's a Niga Subo, very beautiful too. Uh, and this um, is a Kang table, it's a classical Chinese Kang table with two pieces of um, uh, Yamada Hikaru and a smaller round base by uh, Yagi Kasu. And all share the dark color and the square shapes I've said Yagi's that is kind of roundish and, and finish it up the, the it's and soften the, the, the picture, so to speak. Um, this is what I would call borrowing landscape because instead of using what is inside of the house, I'm using what is outside of the house. So for me, this is like a, a portrait from the 15th or 16th century, um, where you have the portraits are the, the two pieces. Um, one is from uh, Yoshikawa Masamishi, and the other one is from uh, Kato Tukura. It's a, he calls it Kokoro, which I think is a beautiful name. Um, what you see is through the window, you see the forest in the background. Um, and this is, a uh, great uh, piece of Suboi Asuka, and also below a window with the trees and the sky prolonging the view. It's also more about outside than inside. And this is, this picture I love because of the light. Uh, this is Mishima Kimiyo's work. And, and in the background you have the rays of the, of the setting sun that are filtering through the, through the tall building in New York City. So it's very dramatic, but very simple at the same time. And this is, is what I call my friends. Um, they are also overlooking Central Park, so it's also borrowing the long distance of, of the park. I am sure everyone now understands when I said Pilar has a great grounding in Japanese aesthetic sensibility. You can see it at every turn, whether we're in her country house or her um, area above Central Park West. Really beautiful. Each piece, and I've seen some of these pieces in different locations. They keep moving around, which she said. And it's well, the Takigoshi, and it's a new place. I like the way you've moved it around. And I, I love the play and the, the joy of moving a piece to a new location. and rediscovering it, if you will, um, and in the new context. So now I'm going to turn back to each of our speakers for one last question with, with each of them. So my first, um, my first second question, if you will, to Paul, is uh, the display of objects presents a challenge that is quite distinct from flat or framed works of art. What is your process for the selection and shelving and pedestal materials that are used for their creation and design? Furthermore, what considerations um, do you focus on for the all important and ever problematic use of lighting design? 
Do you rely on specific proportions for display areas? And lastly, does the Japanese term that Pilar just referred to, barred landscape, enter into your design concept? Paul? Yeah, yes to all three. Okay. <laughs> um, it's, it's, always, uh, it's always a unique experience, I think, um, and each, each situation brings its own challenges. Um, so I guess I, I will talk about these. Um, uh, this is a house in, on the Big Island of Hawaii uh, by the famous uh, Mexican architect Ricardo Legareta. And uh, uh, I was given a slab of stone ledge on the wall for the master bedroom. And I had to uh, decide, decide what uh, relationship that slab could have to art and objects. And um, uh, my clients have, uh, in their city home, they had a, a very large collection of Ikebana baskets, and they were intrigued by the new art, newer art form of, of the tradition of uh, woven bamboo into modern forms. And we found this piece at a, a some show I can't recall now, but it, it we all loved it. And then they had a beautiful Khmer statue, and we designed the um, uh, two stools to complete the uh, collection. Uh, this is the other side of the room. Uh, this is, um, again, the Legaretta's um, uh, architecture is very strong, uh, very bright colors. Um, this house is uh, right on the water on the Big Island of Hawaii. And uh, uh, for those of you that don't know uh, who uh, uh, Ricardo Legaretta was, uh, he, Luis Barragan, the, the famous Mexican uh, first modern modernist architect uh, in South America, um, or Mexico rather, and uh, he um, uh, he was his protege. So there's very this this incredible strength of, of architecture. So this uh, lacquer piece is by the uh, uh, one of the, the I love how the Japanese have John correct me if I'm wrong, but they call them the national living treasures. Or, or is, that, is that how living 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 national treasures? Living national treasure, which I love. I just love the term. And um, uh, he was still alive when we bought this uh, in the gosh, 80s, I guess, 90s. Um, and uh, so, uh, it, it has a very, it's a very powerful uh, lacquer and the way the light hits it, the gold and the, the black lacquer. Um, then in, in a more contemporary way, uh, Hiroshi Sinju is a, a, one of my favorite artists. And um, uh, my clients built this beautiful home in Hawaii and we were shopping for art and we and we said, oh, wouldn't a waterfall be nice? We look at this this artist. We like really like it. And then we found out, not knowing that this is actually a waterfall in Hawaii. But he, he and and he did a whole series of Hawaiian waterfalls. And so it was kind of a wonderful uh, match. But the, these what what you can't quite see in the in the picture is that this is the way it's done. Is uh, you you really think it's it's active water. It, it is so dimensional. And uh, the house was very strong architecture. This is this had a very strong presence at the, uh, at the bar at the uh, in their family room. And then um, Joan Joan helped me find this amazing um, uh, screen of doors. Mm -hmm. And uh, she taught me that that uh, the Japanese did not do a lot of palm <laughs> palm trees, and so it's pretty rare to find something that felt tropical uh, in a in a Japanese screen. And uh, this was a particularly complicated installation. We had to, one to treat the doors as individual screens. And we had a very, it was a very complicated because it, the architect created this wall that was curved and leaning and it's a gallery. And so each the, and, and so we had only one opportunity to drill into the stone. So the whole thing had to be figured out ex in great detail. And each each bracket is custom made, and each one is different than the other because of all the angles. Bonnie, if you switch to the next, yeah, here's the the actual screen from Jones, um, uh, as I as, we, as it was intended to be used, and then we broke it apart just enough to give give it a, a breathing room, and then mounted it on the on this curved wall. You can see it in, in these two images. You can on the left one, you get a little closer image, and then if this is actually the entry hall. So you see it as you come down the corridor. And it's, a, it's very dramatic. And you also see how they had to stay straight up. It, uh, now this project is kind of fun. It's, it's on the water in Sausalito. Those of you are familiar with the San Francisco Bay, Sausalito's across the Golden Gate Bridge. 
and we're looking out at um, Angel Island um, in San Francisco is off to the right. Um, the clients love everything nautical, everything watery, curves. So uh, we designed this um, uh, counter top and cast glass that had a wave motion. And then Joan introduces to the, uh, these amazing sculptures by um, uh, Kendo Sazoshi, Sazoshi? Sazoshi? Um, which of course feel like waves and our client went mad for them. <laughs> so they, they bought a number of them. And uh, I'm very, very fond of this uh, uh, artist and, and the, the, the color particularly. I think um, now this is an, a, um, a tricky one. Uh, this uh, client has uh, built this house in Southern California, ground up, and the clients uh, loved um, everything Japan, about Japan, and, and had a lot of business dealings in Japan, but had never collected anything Japanese. And so we were at, but they liked deco furniture also, so it was a similar situation to Joan. Uh, we, we bought the desk first and the chairs, and then we were thinking about this room, and we were at an art show. And we found this collection of copper uh, Japanese um, vases. And uh, these are all from the from 1930s to the 1970s and uh, uh, very bright and colorful and happy. But the client needed um, uh, the storage space behind her desk to operate in a, in a functional way so that there would be file cabinets, printers, all those things. So the, the room is upholstered in a Thai silk and then each of the uh, display units is actually stationary and the doors move around it. And uh, again, lighting became very important. Uh, we have a close up showing the, how that was, this works. So, yeah. so, so that each shelf is cantilevered within the fabric um, container and that each shelf is upholstered, but it's, it's only attached at the back. And then that LED strip is hidden when the door comes over it. So the whole thing is evenly lit. Very complicated. Um, now, this this was a fun project in Hawaii. Also, a client wanted a Japanese style home, and uh, and they did a lot of very Japanese things. Uh, it's, it's not a pure Japanese home, but it's an American version of a Japanese home. And they they really wanted a uh, cedar uh, painted screen, but all the um, old ones were very not big enough, didn't fit. And then they said, well, how can we, if we're gonna do it, let's, let's make one and make it uh, Hawaiian. So this is breaking the rules a bit, but that's, that is Mauna Kea instead of Mount Fuji. And it's a Hawaiian tree and all Hawaiian birds. And then I, my artist has did a fantastic job. It's really, and it's painted on the, the, the raw cedar. And then in their master bedroom, we did a, um, the screens were always on the floor, as you all know but they wanted um, to see this screen and have it a conventional bed. So um, uh, we mounted the screen in a kind of a Takonoma uh, style. Uh, so it's surrounded in teak and the screen is folded because Hawaii has earthquakes, it's, it's very well anchored also. Early in my career, I, I used Japanese tansus as you saw in the previous picture, there were bedside tables, but this is probably the most unusual tansu I've ever sold. Um, we think it was done for the Hawaiian market, uh, the, the sugar uh, barons of the early, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. And they think it, it's only the one, only one I've ever seen. And um, the dealer that sold us is the only one they've ever seen, <laughs> but it made it, uh, it was a wonderful um, addition to this Japanese home. And then we did a traditional uh, takonoma with the teak, the ikebana basket and uh, the hanging scrolls. Uh, which, which the client ro rotates, which is a, a, a very beautiful way to display. Oh, and this is my own home. You can see the background behind me, uh, which I'm not actually in, that's a projection. <laughs> but um, this, the screen here is a, um, uh, a Japanese deco screen, and it's just about the gilded forms, which I, I've always loved. And again, it had to be uh, mounted flat because of the practicality of where it is. And uh, the uh, table is actually a period Ming scholar's desk and then a few Han pieces. So I'm, I've always been very interested in that. So I have a night shot also that sh the lighting you can't see during the day, but the, the, the screen is quite reflective. So you can sort of see it in this uh, night shot. Uh, so as you can see, I think Japanese, um, Asian, Japanese style really works well with um, our profession. 
Uh, Paul, that was beautiful. I actually, next time I go to Hawaii, I want an entree. I want to see these houses in the flesh. How you mounted those Kawabato Ryushi Fusuma doors on the curvilinear bending sloped wall is uh, an architectural marvel. I had no idea you did that. Yeah. Um, well, you, you asked, you asked how, how what difficult installations can be. <laughs> that was one of the more difficult. Unbelievable, and it worked. It's amazing. Uh, and as to this, your Ishimatsu screen, I know the screen in its prior location. It's it's a sort of um, a hallmark of your sensibility. I love the screen. It's it, to me, this screen represents you. Thank you. So it's nice to see it back again. Thank you. Uh, Pilar, may I ask uh, the next question to you? Uh, collectors in our audience are familiar with the all important signed and sealed boxes that safely house their designated work of art, but they do leave a large footprint whether or not the work is actually residing within the box. We even have a collector uh, who converted their third bathroom into a storage area exclusively for their boxes. If for a New York apartment owner, they're a nightmare. How do you deal with these kiribako that are largely made from polonia wood? And have you found some creative and maybe practical ways to store them? Well, the, the best part is that I have two places. I have an apartment, and then I have the house, which helps. Um, this is in the apartment. And this is a, a closet that is, um, pretty deep, actually. And as you can see when it's open. And I have in there medium and slightly big uh, boxes. Um, some of them are uh, empty and some of them are uh, with their ceramic inside. Um, that's convenient because you almost don't see. Uh, this apartment used to have three bathrooms uh, now we remove one and I'll make it smaller and this is the rest. So you almost don't see that if, if you walk into the apartment. And then this um, is also a, a wall closet and also is a place where I keep my books about art, the one that I have in, in the apartment. And I keep smaller boxes um, in the lower part, in the, in the drawers there. You can open the right. So in those drawers, uh, I keep um, tea balls, um, sake cups, tokui, things like that. And on the upper part, I keep um, uh, boxes for water jars um, and books. Um, this is in the house. And what we did the house, because the house looked like a colonial house, a farmhouse from outside, we did borrow this idea from the Shakers, from the American Shakers, of building a wall of closet. But of course, they don't look, they are a contemporary closet. Um, uh, we have one closet is for storage, and another closet is for uh, displaying ceramics. So it's one display, one close, one display, one close, one in, one out. And the, the doors um, fall completely over the next uh, door. So it's totally clean. Um, you can see, if you want to see the displays, that's how you look at it. And the, and the closets that have ceramic for display, display have a, a background with a mirror. So you can see the ceramics from behind without having to turn them around. Um, there I have medium, small, big, all sort of thing because there's a lot of space in there actually. And then, of course, we have a basement. It's a, and the really big house and, and, and big pieces are in the basement, the, the boxes. And the good thing is that big uh, ceramic pieces most of the time don't have boxes because they are too big and too heavy. Um, but that's, that's how we store and display and live with them. 
and Pilar, having visited your beautiful home um, in the country, I've marveled at these closet viewing spaces and your very clever use of mirrors, uh, which behind us is a, a wall of windows overlooking beautiful countryside. So without having to have electrical um, illumination, the pieces have enough light and have a sense of depth. That's right. Um, just as they are. And their, their footprint, if you will, in the box is literally next door. So if you want to rotate them, it's very easy to just stick it in the box and put it back and put something yeah. else there because they're, they're adjacent to one another. Uh, so it, it's actually brilliant. I have lots of clients, lots of museum clients. No one has come up with this uh, very clever way of storage. So I'm, I'm very happy to share this with our audience tonight. Um, and Jane, you are the architect behind a space many in our audiences are familiar with, which is my gallery. Designing a space dedicated to Japanese art display, one that is open to the general public, yet is also a functional space for business, must have presented um, quite a number of considerations distinct from your residential design. And I know, because I've met some of your other galleries that you brilliantly designed, but mine is quite different from any of them. Could you tell us about how this gallery design came together and how you envisioned the display of Japanese art overlooking Madison Avenue? Jane? I just wanted to say thank you because this has been so interesting <laughs> and I'm seeing a lot of ideas that maybe we can steal. <laughs> um, so, your gallery is extremely different because it's not the white box. Um, but I, I think really the huge factor in all of this is you, Joan, because it was really a mandate that you gave us. Um, so, you know, if I think about the process, you know, we met many times and you talked many times about needing flexibility, simplicity, display, the lighting was extremely important to you. And then I think you went to Japan and then you came back and totally turned the project on its head and said, I've seen this artist's house and these are the materials that we need to use. And for me, it was actually incredibly exciting because they were materials that were raw and simple and had a sense of the hand and in a way could offer this compliment to the ceramics when the glaze is kind of bubbling and crackling and or with the wood fired pieces or at times could be an absolute contrast to the pieces. So the approach I think that we took because the gallery is not a large space is in a way it too is bespoke and handmade and Part of what we tried to do is create these separate spaces within the one room. And so we inserted the steel frames around the column that makes it feel that when you go into the sitting area, you're actually passing through a threshold. And then the second frame, steel frame sort of framed the captured view of the recessed window. And then a major sculptural element for us is the shelving piece that we designed that I know you and I spent many hours trying to figure out. And again, this piece again was like, it's handmade, everything is individual, every piece is designed and thought about. The wood shelves incorporated lighting, the glass shelves allowed lighting to come through it. And then the last piece of this shelving unit was that we have the movable panel in the back which has grass embedded in it so it again recalls an organic nature that is relevant to a lot of the ceramic pieces that you often display on this shelving unit um yeah and i guess the other in the th other interesting thing i was talking to tom my partner and he said you know we could have put this shelving unit anywhere but we centered it and then we purposefully had it cross the line of one of the thresholds to create that tension that you set up boundaries and then you break them and there's these layering of systems um so the next piece 
This is just a view from your office. Again, the thresholds are very important and the views through very similar to like a Japanese captured view. So at the entry to your office, it created a display that's on a very intimate level, which could be used for tea bowls. And then again, we put the steel threshold in the floor. So again, it would be this sense of procession. You leave the gallery and you kind of cross this threshold and go into your private realm, which is your office. This is just a detail of the corner and um, part of the way that you can begin to articulate space in one room and give place in space is to use different materials. So the corner of the gallery that has the window in it was lined in reclaimed barn board. And then there's the ledge of the Corten steel. And here's a larger picture of that window, which again, like Pilar talked about, is using the captured view on Madison. And the, the view is articulated more and framed with the barn board. And then again, you have the Corten steel ledge. And this is the last shot. And um, the floor in your gallery is all a reclaimed pine and all of the credenzas in the gallery, we found this mill worker who again would use the reclaimed plot, use the reclaimed pine. But I don't know if you can see in the picture, but within the cracks, there is epoxy. And I love the way you guys displayed the piece on top because the epoxy in the reclaimed pine is very much like the lacquered lid on the piece that's sitting on the top of the credenza. So um, I guess for me, one of the things that's wonderful about doing this event is that I can't tell you how honored and happy I am that 17 years later, <laughs> you are still in the same spot and very little of it has changed. So thank you. It has really been an honor. Oh, Jane, it's been a joy. And um, I think of you, um, if not daily, almost daily. Uh, as I crossed the various thresholds from space to space. And I remember your concept. Uh, this space was a hideous monstrosity before Jane tackled it. It was, it had AstroTurf as carpeting. Uh, there were plywood dividers. She re-envisioned the entire space. And the only thing we were left with was that one column. And you decided to make that column the fulcrum of the entire space and how you divided the space visually without building walls, but using different materials and make it so that people circumambulate the space. It's worked brilliantly for 17 years. Um, it, it's a joy and it's remarkably successful. So I am very grateful. Thank, Thank you, Jane. You. And um, we're saving the best for last, Monsieur Couturier. Um, continuing to look beyond residential design, what are some of the public examples that incorporate uh, Japanese art design and aesthetics into a Western context. Is there a space that anyone in our audience could visit in order to experience, in your opinion, that really demonstrates such a successful synergy? Robert? I, I think that it's Tadeo on Yondo's uh, museum in Fort Worth, mm. uh, which I think is, is unbelievably beautiful. I mean, me personally, my my aesthetics are far more complete, far more, uh, I don't know, not complicated, but far more uh, decorated, I should say, than the Japanese uh, Japanese art. What I found extraordinary in this structure is the complete beauty that almost makes you think of a cathedral, in the way that there is you know, a movement towards the tall, the great, the light, and the reflection on the pool of water is extraordinary. And, you know, as um, sort of a box for art, really, it is, there is nothing that's superfluous. There is nothing that can be removed and there's nothing that can be added. It is just, uh, it's just perfect. 
And I think that I've never been to Japan, but I remember, you know, looking at pictures of Kyoto, or all these different, you know, um, temples and 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 places, and even the Imperial Palace in in in, in Tokyo, is all nothing. There is there is a, a sparsity which I think is incredibly beautiful and a lesson to all of us, especially for people like me who have a tendency to add more than necessary. And I think that this picture particularly is, you know, it's a Gothic cathedral minus the decoration. And I think there's a sense of proportion and a sense of, of volume that we, we as Europeans can always, uh, can of course learn, learn from. And, uh, and it's, I mean, I was taken, I, I was really speechless when I went to see it from the outside to the experience of coming into the space. I think it's just extraordinary, and I think I'm sure that all of you have have seen it, mm. and uh, it it is just breathtaking, to a degree actually that the art in it is, I'm not going to say relevant because the art is relevant, but it is a piece of art in itself, and I think that is as that has a lot to do with Japanese sensitivities and and its art form is that everything is an art, everything is whether it's the house itself or what's inside of it. And also, you know, it is so um, so un-European in the fact that there is uh, a great modesty that exists in this architecture and in, in this decorative arts. There is no uh, there is no trash kiss and and you know excessive <laughs> of everything. So well said, Robert. I think it's an exquisite building. But you do remind me of many uh, contemporary structures made for museums where the architecture takes over the content of what's in the art in, inside the galleries. And there's a competition between the structure and the art, um, which is a whole nother panel discussion to be sure. But the one thing I've learned, you haven't been to Japan. That has to get changed. We have to get you to Japan. I think you might change your entire aesthetic sensibility with one uh, three week trip to Japan. So we'll it's incredibly scary to consider. Oh, no, no, <laughs> I, I will. I will manage everything. Don't worry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so thank you all. This has been incredibly illuminating. I hope visually stimulating for our audiences. Um, it's been a joy to bring all of you people who are all very special chapters in my personal life as well as my public life together. Um, and we're going to I, I will tell you what's coming up to our audience before I take a couple questions. Um, for those of you who are in New York or can visit New York this month, our current exhibition is called uh, Branching Out, which focuses on two legacy families in Japan's ceramic tradition, the Kanashige family from Bizen and the Miwa family from White Glazed Hagi. The exhibition, for those of you who are not in town, uh, is viewable online on our website. Furthermore, there are several major publications that have come out and are coming out in the next couple months. Um, for those of you interested in Japanese clay art specifically, Kondo Takahiro, Body Vessel Void, was published this spring by Japan's premier publisher, um, which is part of uh, Sataya. It's an oversized hardcover collector's volume with exquisitely um, illustra exquisite illustrations and design edited by our dear friend, Joe Earl, and with essays from a number of museum directors and curators throughout the West, including the artist himself and myself. Uh, this book is available through Tsutaya, but also through us, for those of you who don't wanna deal with Japan. It's not cheap, but it's a must have for those who love this incredible artist's work. Uh, scheduled to be released on June 14th is Listening to Clay by Alice and Halsey North and our beloved friend Louise Court. It's available online now on Amazon and then in bookstores. If you buy it now, I think there's still a 20% discount on the book. Uh, and it's comprised of, uh, of interviews conducted by these three uh, passionate lovers of Japanese clay art with 16 major figures uh, in the field that they interviewed on numerous occasions. Uh, we will be hosting an, uh, an exhibition based on this book with contributions from each of those men and women um, that will be opening in middle of July. 
Our next Zoom talk, which will also be in July, will bring together the authors of that book together uh, with Monica Binsick, the curator of Japanese decorative arts at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And we will discuss the book as well as the new installation on the balcony of the Met, which features many of these artists and will learn many interesting insights from uh, these new um, recounting of, of these interviews. Actually, I wanna ask Allison Halsey and, and Louise, some really in-depth and behind the scenes questions to what really went on during these interviews and what they learned or what they didn't report in the book. So we can look forward to all three of those publications and events. Uh, we just have a couple of questions and I know we're running long. Uh, one is to you, Jane, which has to do with the materials you used for your client's home in New England and how you selected that particular wood material and what that would might be made from? So we chose a dark wood because the floor was existing and it's, a, it's an old floor from France, I think. And then there was also an old door, an antique door. So we knew we wanted it dark. And um, then my client brought in a mill worker and when he saw the length of the shelves that we wanted floating off the wall, he made the suggestion of the sapele wood because it is dark in tone and it would allow him to get long slabs for the shelves. So it's sapele. Um, maybe I have a call. I have a question for Paul. Um, as, as a um, designer, um, particularly in Hawaii, and dealing with the natural elements there, for instance, your the house with the beautiful fasumadors. You've got a lot of salt air and you've got a lot of sunshine coming in. How do you deal with uh, climatic issues in a context like Hawaii, which is a very different climate from that of Japan? Yes, the, uh, the salt and, and winds are brutal. Um, very pleasant, but brutal. Uh, so uh, all, all the homes have extensive um, uh, air conditioning systems, uh, but um, in Hawaii, because the weather is often very pleasant midday, the houses are opened up for uh, when the when the clients are in residence. So there's a lot of extremes that have happened, and the clients are just are willing to deal with that. Um, and uh, we also the all all the houses have extensive blackout when they're not in residence, and the air conditioning has to stay on at all times for humidity and and temperature control. But when they're when they're there, we just let it go. And, and everybody just enjoys it. And if it needs repair, it gets repaired. Wonderful. Living, living. I, I, not what a museum wants to hear, but. No, like no, but, 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 I, but clients need to hear it, that you can, need to live with your art, you know? Yeah. If it breaks, you fix it, you know, it's just, a, it's life. Uh, well, we did a panel on Kintsugi, which is gold lacquer repair. For those of us who, who are ourselves or our housekeepers or our grandchildren, causes some disaster to take part and we repair the work and make the work perhaps arguably better than it was before. In, indeed. In work of art. Indeed, I love that. It's, it's an art form itself. Yes, most especially. Um, a question for Pilar, if you don't mind. Uh, Pilar, um, as a, a serious collector of Chinese ceramics initially, how do you think you are um, acumen and your taste for things Chinese, which is so different from Japanese, did that previous collecting direction impact your collection of Japanese or is it completely different? Of course it's impacted. And, and, the, and the Spanish pieces that I used to buy also impacted because they, they are use of earth and clay and the glazes are similar. Um, even if you think that that the Spanish glaciers are totally different, you see a glaze. Actually, the first time that I saw a Liao piece, I went into the store and I said, what is that? Because the glaze was exactly the same that the glaze that a potter uh, 10 miles from my hometown was doing, except that the shape was different. So he told me, oh, that's a Liao, a Liao piece. I said, what is that? So. They are very similar. Um, and one of the things that I that I bought also, like like Paul, um, I was buying um, 
Han and I was uh, buying uh, Warren Estates, which are very earthy pieces. And it's very easy from that to go to, to Japan because they really use that material. They are very earthy. And frankly, if you go to places what they are using the Japanese in a very uh, creative way are really the places that the Chinese developed in the 11th and 12th century. So uh, it's a continuation on, on the space and a continuation in my taste. In, Except that that the way they manipulate the clay and the glazes and they are so creative uh, that you cannot compare with what yeah. they was using uh, in in China. They they were more. These are the shapes and these are the glazes and this is how it goes. So um, it's the same, but it's really very different at the same time. Um, you showed a slide of the Kato Tsubusa in your barred landscape slide with the big globular piece by Yoshikawa, but on the right was the, the heart. Right. And I will never forget in all my travels to Japan of taking Pilar to visit that artist uh, with a few other collector crazy people. And Pilar almost had a nervous breakdown. She was so in love with this artist's work, she could not control herself. She was in, in ecstasy. I would have bought all the pieces. Yeah, well, you couldn't because we wouldn't let you because somebody else had to have something. But she was passionately in love. And, and as a dealer and a person who's trying to um, bring this material to the West and making people experience it in different ways, uh, her reaction to that, it, I wish I had had a movie camera. That's, I would have made a commercial. You know, it was I just think, what we need. I think he's a genius because he's manipulating porcelain mm -hmm. like he's earthenware and then uh, which are heavy pieces. Porcelain is very difficult to, to uh, manipulate. And then they have these huge pieces and then they have this delicate uh, blue glaze on top. I, I think the guy is a genius. Yeah, <laughs> but she fell in love. We had to keep his girlfriend away. <laughs> so um, thank you all. We're, we're getting on 6.30. I'm sure we've lost a few people who want to go eat dinner or breakfast, depending on where the, what time zone they're in. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and especially to my marvelous friends and panelists. It's been a joy working with you on this small project. And thank you all. Stay safe and hope to see you for our next Zoom project in, in July. Stay Hi. safe, everybody. Thank, thank you very you. much.